Um, my name is Walid Hineini, and I work at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta in the US. Um, I am uh, very happy to welcome you to the 2020 HIV Transmission Workshop. We have assembled a great program for you today. Um, and we, um, we have some numbers to share with you about um, this meeting. We will have four sessions, two half days. That includes 11 invited lectures and nine oral presentations. We have uh, more than 417 um, registrations online from 71 countries. And we welcome everyone for this international workshop, HIV transmission. The history of the workshop has been going on for a long time, for many years, and it focuses on um, uh, you know, the biology and the epidemiology of uh, controlling HIV prevention and provides a, an important forum for uh, addressing all aspects of HIV transmission and principle of interventions. This is our first virtual um, meeting. We typically all meet in person. So we will be learning how to operate today in this virtual world. Um, here are some guidance from us from virology education um, you to submit your questions uh, to the live Q&A. Um, and we also invite you to uh, look at the uh, e-posters at the poster uh, gallery. Uh, you could also chat and connect with people through the meeting hub. Um, and uh, of course, we there will be some technical uh, issues, but uh, I think the organizers have a technical assistant ready for us. And this is by clicking the uh, live support hub. Like every year, your feedback is very important for us. We look at your um, um, surveys of the different sessions, your scores, and we use that in planning next year's program. So we really encourage you to provide and fill out those session surveys and provide us with your input. Um, it is very important. And actually that input also is shared with the funders and with different institutions that uh, help uh, support this meeting. Uh, here's a big acknowledgement uh, for a big acknowledgement for the organizing committee. Um, this year, uh, I have the privilege of um, um, co-organizing the meeting with uh, Dr. Uh, um, Arthus from the NIH, uh, but we are shared uh, with uh, many members here that are shown that have contributed substantially to the program. And also a big acknowledgement to our endorsers from academic institutions um, uh, listed here. And also some uh, support for virology education uh, from uh, uh, Gilead and Jensen. And this morning, uh, Dr. Phyllis Kenke and I, we will be co-chairing session one and we're very excited about this session. Um, that will be focusing on um, ending the HIV epidemic initiative in the US. And we have assembled a group of uh, experts to uh, describe to us um, what uh, ending the HIV epidemic in the US will, will entail and what research or activities are still needed to make this a really successful, um, a successful initiative. So um, I will start first by introducing um, Dr. John Brooks, who will give us an introduction to EHE. Um, and, um, and then we will, my co-chair and I will alternate with the different uh, presenters. We have structured in a way that each speaker will cover one of the pillars uh, of EHE and gives us uh, their, uh, their thoughts and uh, input on that, uh, on each of those pillars. So um, again, introducing Dr. John Brooks, he serves as the chief medical officer to the CDC's division of HIV AIDS prevention, where he coordinates the division activities related to the new national ending the HIV epidemic initiative. 
uh, Dr. Brooks has uh, primary areas of expertise in prevention and treatment um, uh, of HIV infection. And he has been at CDC, he started at CDC way back in 1998. So John. Hello, I'm John Brooks, the Chief Medical Officer of CDC's Division of HIV AIDS Prevention. And this morning, I'd like to introduce the National Initiative for Ending the HIV Epidemic in the U.S., a plan for America. I'm going to close my image now because I have a lot I want to share with you, and I don't want my image cluttering the slides. I have no relevant financial affiliations to disclose. HIV has cost America too much for too long. Since 1981, approximately 700,000 Americans with HIV have died, most due to some aspect of the infection. At present, the U.S. government spends $28 billion for HIV prevention and care, and without intervention and despite substantial progress, CDC estimates there will be another 400,000 Americans with HIV over the next 10 years, and this despite available prevention tools. Today, we are at a critical crossroads in the U.S. HIV epidemic. Since its peak in the 1980s, when new infections almost reached 130,000 per year, we have seen a steady decline between 1985 and 2012. This is due to better and better prevention interventions. These have driven the number of new infections down to fewer than 40,000 annually. However, since 2013, after this period of decline, HIV infections have stabilized. We have stalled. And at present, the number of new infections each year hovers between 39,000 and 36,000. Now is the time to end the HIV epidemic. Not only do we have access to the most powerful HIV prevention and treatment tools in history, but Cutting edge prevention technologies and strategies help us identify where those services are most urgently needed so we can direct them. By equipping communities at risk with these tools, we can end the HIV epidemic in America. Ending the HIV epidemic initiative or the EHE initiative is built on four epidemiologic principles. Our goal is simple reduce the prevalence of persons capable of transmitting HIV. We aim to achieve an incidence of less than one per 100,000 persons per year, which is the WHO's definition of epidemic control. We hope to reach a point where the deaths of persons reaching the end of their natural life exceeds new infections and thereby prevalence falls. We can do this with four key steps diagnose all people with HIV as early as possible, treat people with HIV rapidly and effectively to reach sustained viral suppression, prevent new HIV transmissions using proven interventions like pre-exposure prophylaxis and syringe service programs, and be poised to respond quickly to potential HIV outbreaks to get needed prevention and treatment services to the people who need them. We hope over the next five years to reduce new infections by 75% and by the end of 10 years by 90%. With an estimated lifetime health care cost of about a half a million dollars per person with HIV, CDC estimates that the EHE program goals, if achieved, will reduce federal medical expenditures for HIV by over $100 billion over the coming decade. This initiative requires the close collaboration of six operating divisions within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, shown in the boxes to the right. As noted, this 10-year initiative aims to reduce new infections by 90% over 10 years, and we aim to do this by leveraging scientific advances in HIV prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and care, 
and to also leverage the highly successful programs of the HHS agencies related to HIV. Our first goal is to diagnose all persons with HIV as early as possible. Early diagnosis is essential to end the HIV epidemic, and yet too few Americans have access to this life-saving treatment, treatment that every American deserves. We know now that about one in two or half of persons diagnosed with HIV have been living with the infection for three years or more, and that one in four persons, or about 25%, have had HIV for seven years. CDC estimates that about 20% of persons are diagnosed with advanced disease, meaning they've had the infection for many years, and that less than 40% of people in America have ever been tested for HIV. This means that about 80% of annual new HIV infections are transmitted by people who don't yet know they have HIV or who are not in effective care. Second, we must treat people with HIV rapidly and effectively to help them reach sustained viral suppression. HIV treatment has two important benefits. First, effective treatment keeps people alive and healthy. And second, effective treatment with a suppressed viral load can prevent sexual transmission of the infection. So this means that the earlier you treat someone, the better their health and the less likely they are to transmit HIV onwards. We want to get people suppressed as quickly as we can after their diagnosis. This figure looks, like, looks at the estimated fraction of persons by state who achieved viral suppression within six months of their diagnosis. We'd like most of the states shown here among those reporting to be in that 95% pink zone. You can see from the dark red, we have plenty of room for improvement. Third, we need to prevent new HIV transmissions by using proven interventions like pre-exposure prophylaxis and syringe service programs. Let me talk for just a moment about pre-exposure prophylaxis. PrEP is highly effective, but unfortunately underutilized. CDC estimates that over a million people might benefit from PrEP, but today less than 25% of these people are using it. Now we've seen some encouraging trends, particularly among men who have sex with men or MSM, a group at particularly high risk of HIV infection. Between 2014 and 2017, the use of PrEP among MSM in the US rose from 6% to 35%, and awareness of PrEP increased from 60% to 90%. But let's hone in a little more on these values. Look at 2017. This is the use of PrEP broken down by race, ethnicity, and the benefit is not evenly spread. Whites are using PrEP more than Blacks or Latinos. This is another important area for improvement. We also need syringe service programs to protect people who inject drugs from getting HIV. Since the Scott County outbreak of HIV among people who inject drugs in 2015, CDC has been concerned about a resurgence in infections in this group where we have really driven new infections down. Following Scott County, CDC began promoting efforts around the country to expand syringe service programs, particularly in the 220 counties shown in green here. But despite all of this work, we continue to see clusters and outbreaks of HIV among people who inject drugs. This is going to be a critical area for future success, especially following the COVID pandemic and the economic damage that's it incurred. Okay, here we are, now I'm back. And I'd just like to close by saying that I very, very sincerely believe that ending the HIV epidemic in America is possible, but it's going to require all of us working together. We need to be disruptively innovative because now is the time. Thank you.
Great, that was a wonderful introduction. And we'll move on to the next speaker, who's Jeffrey Johnson. Uh, Jeffrey Johnson has been at the CDC for the last 22 years. He's currently the lead of the HIV diagnostics team in the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention Laboratory. And this oversees three diagnostic activities, test development, surveillance, and reference testing. His earlier research uh, looked at adventitious retroviruses in live virus vaccines, and also expanded a program uh, to diagnose HIV drug resistance. So Jeffrey will talk to us about ending the HIV epidemic. Uh, the first pillar of ending the epidemic is to diagnose. I have no conflicts to declare. Thank you for the invitation to speak at this meeting. Today I will be discussing the HIV, ending the HIV epidemic pillar diagnose, which is the first pillar of EAG. The goal of this pillar is to diagnose all people with HIV as early as possible. Where we are today, despite the 2006 CDC recommendation that all persons between 13 and 64 years of age be tested at least once, population engagement has been suboptimal. Approximately 1.1 million people in the United States are living with HIV, 14% are unaware of their infection. In the current era of highly effective treatment and interventions, approximately 38,000 new infections are still occurring annually. However, it seems that the trend is tipping downward. We must address the shortfall in testing awareness and engagement with the right testing approaches that are supportive of individual needs. The aim of the four pillars of EHE is to drive HIV incidence to a low reproductive rate by the year 2030. Greater saturation of testing is essential to assessing this benchmark. CDC efforts for the diagnosed pillar are working in collaboration with communities and other agencies to increase local capacity to expand HIV testing according to CDC guidelines so that all people with HIV in the high burden areas receive a diagnosis. CDC efforts involve some key approaches, using the latest systems and technologies to make HIV testing simple, accessible, and truly routine in healthcare and non-healthcare settings. The use or expansion of telemedicine and telehealth, an expansion of HIV self-tests or mail-in self collected test kits. There are some challenges to testing. Some socioeconomic barriers include stigma. Stigma is a leading barrier to seeking testing. There are some financial considerations, such as being able to take time off from work, having appropriate transportation to get to the testing site, and the test costs themselves, as well as awareness of testing opportunities. Some challenges in the technical arena involve being able to identify suppressed infection events under PrEP and other biomedical interventions in the pipeline, which may drive down viral load or antibody detection. Likewise, this may be the case for a rapid start of ART, which may lessen the analytes for diagnostic detection. There are some challenges in the availability of self-testing options that meet individual needs. And additionally, there are limited approved specimen types for testing to be able to meet diagnostic needs. And these tests require rigorous FDA review, which sometimes limit their ability to come to market. Factors affecting the use of HIV testing algorithms include local technical capacity, the costs of some testing platforms and whether laboratories are able to afford them, being able to adapt to ever-changing approved technologies, which may then drive updates to diagnostic algorithms. And all of these efforts would require an ability to link to care, which is vital for driving down the epidemic. The current recommended diagnostic algorithm for laboratories takes into account assay sensitivity, the ability to differentiate HIV-1 from HIV-2, and test costs. Currently, a sensitive antigen antibody immunoassay is the first step that if positive 
would be resolved as to HIV type in the secondary differentiation assay. If this test proves negative, then a third step, which is quite complicated and more expensive and not widely available of the nucleic acid test would be necessary. However, there are new high throughput nucleic acid tests coming to the market for HIV-1 and or HIV-2. And these assays may be able to be used as the second or third step depending on their intended use and availability in, circuit, in certain markets. There are diagnostic algorithms for non-clinical settings, which would begin with a rapid test at a testing site and may be confirmed by a second rapid orthogonal test, that is a test of a different type, to confirm infection, or specimens may be sent to laboratories if available in the area for a complete algorithm or an abbreviated laboratory algorithm, each with different associated costs and ability to resolve diagnostics. New area of focus is HIV self-testing. HIV self-testing empowers people in providing greater control over individual testing needs. Self-testers, when provided with multiple tests, are known to distribute tests to their friends. Self-testers have demonstrated an overwhelming capability to perform the test. And a meta-analysis of clinical studies among MSM has showed a 1.9 increased frequency of testing. This resulted in two more tests within a 12 to 15 month period, and also doubled the likelihood of an HIV positive diagnosis. From this analysis, there was no indication of harm attributed to self-testing, and there was no significant increase in risk testing behavior. We're going to go through some gaps in testing technologies, beginning with self-tests. Finger stick blood rapid tests for point of care self-testing is are not currently approved in the United States. Finger stick blood often improves sensitivity over over fluid testing and would be a better option for people who need more frequent testing. Likewise, simplified point of care nucleic acid tests could benefit the needs of very frequent self testers. Additionally, they could provide better screening sensitivity for initiating PrEP programs over that of serologic assays. All of these methods could be benefited by well validated specimen types for self collection. Various specimen types could provide multiple options for diagnoses, viral suppression detection, testing of antiretrovirals or other chemistries, and support telemedicine. There are gaps in laboratory-based testing. This include total nucleic acid testing on whole blood. The combination of RNA and DNA increases the number of diagnostic targets available. Viral RNA can be associated with many blood cell components. As the image shown here on the right, HIV was associated with platelets, and that those targets would be missed with today's conventional plasma testing. Additionally, broader multi-analyte multiplex assays, if available, can be highly sensitive bead-based assays for detection of HIV antibodies, antigen, and nucleic acids. Various combinations used in an algorithm could be an earlier indicator of PREC breakthrough or identify occult infections. In conclusion, there's room to grow in testing from the lab to the living room to achieve EHE goals. The availability of new technologies can help overcome some of these recognized barriers. Self-testing through self-empowerment could increase the frequency of testing and help sustain engagement in care. Understanding and delivering the testing options desired by individuals, local organizations, and laboratories will be vital to the diagnosed killer. Thank you for your time. Yes, um, thank you, Jeff, very much. Um, that, was, that was outstanding. And we'd like to move now to the um, next 
uh, speaker and I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Gulik to, prevent, uh, to present us uh, the talk on the uh, treatment pillar. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gulik is uh, the chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Wild Cornell Medicine and also an attending physician at the New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. Um, he, his research interests include designing, conducting, and analyzing clinical trials to refine antiretroviral therapy strategies for HIV treatments and prevention. Thank you, Dr. Gulik. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. I have no disclosures. In February 2019, the US federal government released their plan to end the HIV epidemic by 2030. This was a five point plan as shown here. We just heard about diagnosis and testing. What I'd like to take on is pillar number two of the end the HIV epidemic, that is treat the infection rapidly and effectively to achieve sustained viral suppression. So treatment involves two things. The first is linkage to HIV medical care. What we're looking at here is the dashboard of the HIV epidemic analysis, the references in the bottom right of the slide. And we're looking at the percentage of people diagnosed with HIV who receive care within a month. As you can see in 2017, that was about 78% of people rising to 80% of people by 2018 and 82% by preliminary numbers by 2019 going in to 2020. That of course is pre-COVID and this may be affected by the COVID epidemic. You can see the goals for 2025 and 2030 are to reach 95% linkage to care. Once we've linked, then we think about antiretroviral therapy. What are our goals? Well, when we use these therapies, we want to suppress the HIV RNA, that is the viral load level, as low as possible for as long as possible. That will help us preserve or enhance immune function and ultimately, in the person living with HIV, to delay their clinical progression of HIV disease and prolong healthy survival. In addition, lowering the viral load prevents ongoing HIV transmission. US guidelines for the initiation of antiretroviral therapy are reviewed for you here, and there are two major sets, the US Department of Health and Human Services guidelines and the International Antiviral Society USA guidelines, both of which are recently updated. What the guidelines say is that anyone with AIDS or symptomatic HIV disease should be offered treatment. And in fact, anyone who's asymptomatic, now regardless of CD4 cell count, should be offered antiretroviral therapy. Increasingly, we're using the strategy of rapid ART start. There are now a total of 33 drugs FDA approved for the treatment of HIV infection with the most recent one earlier this year. As you see here by their three letter codes, there has been a progression of available antiretroviral therapies. We also have guidance from current guidelines. This summarizes the US DHHS guidelines for recommended initial antiretroviral regimens for most patients. And you can see they have a similar structure that is one to two nucleosides with an integrase inhibitor, either Bictegravir, Dolutegravir, or Raltegravir. In addition, we have a number of single tablet ART regimens containing two, three, or four drugs all in one pill. Many of these are appropriate for either initial therapy or maintenance therapy. Can things get simpler than one pill once a day? Well, coming soon, injectable antiretroviral therapy and currently under investigation, implantable ART and even patches to administer ART. So things may even get easier. Well, here is the graph of virologic suppression. This is HIV RNA level less than 200 copies per mil, again, using the national dashboard. You can see in 2017, 63% of 
of people living with HIV had suppressed their viral loads less than 200. And that increased to about 65% by 2018, the latest data available. Now, I should say that there are regional differences. And in my own state of New York, that value is 89% of people suppressed below detection. So it varies across the country. You can see that we have some room to go here. 2025 target will be 95% of people taking antiretroviral therapy will be virologic suppressed. That's our goal. When we drill down and look at specific groups, we can see where interventions would be most effective. If you look by age, you can see that younger people, particularly under the age of 44, have lower suppression rates than people older than that. And if you look among race and ethnic groups, you can see people of color have lower virologic suppression rates than other groups. These are opportunities for interventions. And then when we look by transmission categories, you can see that heterosexual contact or injection drug use as a transmission category, those groups have lower suppression rates than other groups. Again, targeted interventions may help raise these percentages. Lastly, ART confers undetectable to untransmittable. There are excellent published data from large cohort studies really emphasizing this principle, and it is now widely accepted. The CDC in September of 2017 said, people who take ART daily as prescribed and achieve and maintain an undetectable viral load have effectively no risk of sexually transmitting the virus to an HIV negative partner. And this was also emphasized by the National Institutes of Health. Science validates undetectable equals untransmittable. And NIAID director Tony Fauci said, people living with HIV whose virus is completely durably suppressed by treatment will not sexually transmit the virus to an HIV negative partner. There's Dr. Fauci. He needs a new t-shirt. In summary, ending the HIV epidemic, treatment is one of the five pillars of the US strategy for ending the HIV epidemic. Linkage to care is good, but must be improved. Antiretroviral therapy suppresses viral load levels, and this confers benefits both to people living with HIV and reduces the risk of transmission to their sexual or drug using partners. That is you, undetectable, equals you, untransmittable. Finally, virologic suppression rates are good, but must be improved. And there are significant efforts in progress to do that. I would like to thank uh, my institution and the AIDS Clinical Trials Group who performed many of the studies that led to our current recommendations and my friend John Brooks for guiding me with some of the slides. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to remind the audience to be sure to use the, the live Q&A widget to submit their questions. And with that, we'll move on to the third pillar, uh, which is uh, the use of, of PrEP our speaker is Dimitri Daskalakis. He's the Deputy Commissioner for the Division of um, Disease Control in New York City Department of Health, um, and has had a career long, uh, served as a career long physician activist in the area of HIV treatment and prevention with a focus on LGBT communities. Um, this next month, he'll be moving on to a new post as the director of the Division of HIV AIDS at CDC in Atlanta. Um, so we're happy to have this new division director give our next presentation. Thank you very much. My name is Dimitri Daskalakis. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Disease Control at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I'm very excited uh, to be a part of this convening. Um, and today I will give a perspective from a large local health department uh, from the uh, on research needed to expand the use and effectiveness of PrEP. So this is gonna be a very urban view from New York City. I will start by saying I have nothing to disclose. So I'll start by just showing data that I think everyone is familiar with that there are unequal declines in 
HIV. So I'm focusing on New York City data as a local health department. And really, I think the lesson is that, um, that there is heterogeneous uh, declines in HIV um, and also some areas where we have a lot more work to do. So as you see, significant declines in men who have sex with men, but it is um, really uh, uh, graded by race as well as other factors. And you can see sort of the areas in transgender uh, individuals um, where we actually are not seeing declines. But that is also reflected in what we see in PrEP use. So the number of PrEP users, when you look by sex, race, and ethnicity, um, shows that whites are in the lead, uh, despite the fact that they are not um, the uh, folks who are the most uh, impacted uh, by new HIV infections uh, in both our jurisdiction and also nationally. Uh, Blacks, Hispanic, Latinos, and Asians, uh, as well as women, are underrepresented among PrEP users. So. Um, in general, um, there's that Venn diagram that both access to PrEP and reductions in HIV are far lower among Black men who have sex with men, Latino men who have sex with men, cisgender women, especially if they're Black and Latina, and transgender gender people, especially if they're Black and Latina transgender women. So our key question, from my perspective, is how can we expand PrEP use and accelerate declines in HIV among Black, Latino, and Asian men who have sex with men, as well as cisgender women and transgender people? That is our core question. So so some very important research questions from our perspective, living in an urban environment um, with, uh, uh, with a mature HIV uh, epidemic. So what would make PrEP easier and more attractive? And specifically, what would do that for Black people, Latinas and Latinos, and cisgender and transgender women? How do we address racial bias in PrEP prescribing and also PrEP interest? Are there cost barriers to PrEP or perception of barriers to PrEP? And is there a stigma that is different among different groups among using PrEP? How do we increase medical providers' comfort with discussing and prescribing PrEP outside of practices that focus on the health of MSM? And how do you reduce PrEP discontinuation among people at continued risk of HIV? And then also, one of our uh, core uh, strategies in New York City is, how do you better develop and evaluate status-neutral services that focus both on HIV care as well as prevention and delivery models to address the stigma that exists around both prevention and treatment of this infection? So how to reduce stigma around using PrEP? So there are several strategies that have, uh, have been uh, discussed, included are normalizing and universalizing PrEP education and services, centering patient experiences during counseling, and acknowledge the interconnectedness of stigma and structural barriers to care to address disparities in access. So really areas that require more fleshing out and more questions from the perspective of PrEP. Also, we need to focus research on going beyond oral PrEP. So we know that oral PrEP is at a high bar for preventive, uh, preventive effectiveness. So it's important to better understand how to maintain adequate adherence and persistence over time, uh, which continues to be one of the greatest challenges of PrEP implementation. So what might help? New dosing, so PrEP on demand. We have to evaluate all formulations to learn more and consider evaluating it in more populations. Uh, new daily oral options. So is there, uh, uh, are there strategies that can make PrEP more appealing, uh, for instance, <coughs> for individuals who are concerned <coughs> about re real or perceived side effects of so the potential of using tenofovir uh, TAF-based regimens like Descovy, and also um, really critical work in longer acting PrEP formulations. So I think many of these options will help address some, but not all barriers experienced with once daily oral PrEP. And um, also it becomes a core research question of how to implement both current strategies and new strategies more effectively and equitably. So there are also, a, there's an, a need I think highlighted by COVID uh, to show how we can demedicalize PrEP strategies. So we know PrEP is the gateway to primary care. Uh, but is high medical engagement what everyone who uses PrEP wants? That's an important question. So I think work in, in identifying the utility and benefits of initiating same-day PrEP starts without waiting for a lot of lab work, as well as making the PrEP package more compact while preserving safety and efficacy. So my questions are, what is the minimum lab package, including STI testing, required to uh, start and maintain PrEP? What is the minimum care package? Do you have to be seen every uh, once every three months? Uh, I, I mean that both from the perspective of content and frequency. How can we make PrEP more self-serve? I think that's critical, especially when we've seen uh, the impact of, uh, of COVID on healthcare. This is our chance to potentially use those ideas and evaluate further how PrEP can be made uh, more of a self-service option. And can we really 
uh, shoot toward making prescriptions uh, extended to 12 months and coupled to home tests? Can we give more of the PrEP power uh, to people rather than uh, have it be uh, 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 exclusively within a healthcare setting? Now, this slide is just to show that there are a lot of technologies that are coming to uh, um, through research and hopefully eventually to market uh, that may make PrEP a more diverse strategy as well as something uh, more appealing to other folks. So whether it is uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies or injectables or implantables, uh, a lot of work has gone on and needs to continue in the research space around new technology. I won't go deeply into that because that is an uh, 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 that does not need to be emphasized per se, since it is a core piece of, of PrEP research. So choices are critical. So beyond injectables, again, there are long-acting uh, injectable nanoformulations, implantable devices, microneedle patches, broadly ne neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, and agents typically administered by gel, ring, film, or fiber. So really, a lot of areas that require more basic science and clinical in, uh, science research, but then also critical need for implementation science to see which of these and how these may be implemented in the real world. So that means developing models and measures to better understand and understand PrEP initiation, uh, identify patients' uh, thought process behind choice of prevention strategy, switching strategies potentially, as well as discontinuation. We have to better explore provider behavior around PrEP and assess interventions that we can use to change behavior to increase prescribing, especially of different modalities. And also, I'd understand and effective drivers of PrEP decision making to inform patient-centered communications and protect against the implicit bias that often comes in provider recommendations of PrEP use and will likely come in recommendations for different modalities of PrEP use. Several questions. Will long-acting PrEP increase use? Will it be more appealing for certain people or populations? How do people and providers want long-acting PrEP to be implemented? A very important question. And can long-acting PrEP be used for rapid induction and then followed by oral PrEP for maintenance? So will oral PrEP users switch from pills to long acting? So I think that that's a question that, we, that needs to be pursued. I'm not gonna read this slide, but ultimately it looks as if um, uh, individuals uh, who are middle income um, compared to high income are more likely to switch. People who uh, actually had a psychological component to taking pills were more likely to switch to a long acting agent. And um, you know, I think also just generally a lot of qualitative areas that are really critical in understanding how to roll out different uh, formulations and different strategies in a way that is uh, responsive to community. Um, so some several re uh, implementation questions around long acting PrEP include, can HIV breakthrough after a recent injection or implant of PrEP happen? How often and why? Will the option to implant PrEP or receive an injection every month or two attract new people to using PrEP? So will it do uh, increase the options and is that good enough to increase PrEP uptake? How do we reduce medical mistrust as a barrier to PrEP, particularly to clinically intensive and physically invasive modalities? In other words, um, from the perspective of our main barrier, how do we make medicine less racist? Um, what clinical supports will be needed to make people comfortable with an implant or injection and to keep them engaged for follow-up injections or implants? What is the ideal package and what is the minimal package? How can we even make more medical strategies feel less medical to people who may not want to engage to the same depth? There are lessons from contraception. We know that PrEP use will be imperfect, so we have to develop strategies to support use. Continuation rates with injectable are not much higher with other contraceptives, and new technologies will not increase choice if health services to support them uh, don't exist or provide quality care. So it's really a part of that holistic strategy uh, to figure out how to create the perfect package as well as the minimum package. So failure to account for user preference and social context can undermine potential benefits, and a narrow focus on the technology alone is unlikely to solve health and social challenges associated with HIV prevention. So there needs to be a focus on the implementation of the science as well. So if long-acting PrEP lacks a programmatic home for introduction, do we need to find one to be able to expand it? Um, and, and really, the lesson here again is that implementation science is key as we roll out new technologies. Um, in terms of specific populations, looking at cisgender women, several research questions. Will long-acting PrEP increase women's access to and interest in PrEP? Are newer PrEP formulations, including TAP, FTC, safe and effective for cisgender women? A question that we still don't know. Is taking PrEP on demand safe for women? Is it effective during receptive vaginal sex?
How to address barriers of prep is not for me. How do, how do we make discussions of sexual health revolve less about around risk, more around pleasure, and the control that is, provi that is provided by taking pre-exposure prophylaxis? Will women accept an implantable device or an insertable device? How can we better combine PrEP with services that women need? And can contraceptive and PrEP technologies be combined in a way that, are, that is acceptable to women? Moving on to transgender people. Will periodic PrEP injections prove particularly attractive to trans folks who are periodically injecting hormones? Um, why lesser continuity on PrEP happens among transgender persons, we still need to learn more. So what clinical supports are needed to reduce high PrEP discontinuation rate among that community, especially Black and Latina trans women? How to better integrate PrEP, gender affirming care, and services for housing and food stability, really identifying uh, sort of the more holistic needs to create a package um, that for some trans people may provide uh, better support to maintain PrEP um, by really addressing their, uh, their hierarchy of needs. Do gender affirming hormones slow achievement and protective levels of PrEP in tissue when PrEP is taken on demand? That's a really important question. Um, PrEP in adolescence, so more research questions in that space as well. Can updated and comprehensive sexual education increase awareness and use of PrEP? Can that reduce stigma? How to support adolescent adherence? How, um, how can we better support adolescence adherence to and persistence on PrEP? How can we increase youth access to sex positive and LGBTQ affirming care? And how can we actually measure the effect of policy that allows for adolescents to receive PrEP and other sexual health care without parental consent? And again, my favorite question, what is the ideal package? And then what is the minimal package for adolescents to both optimize safety, adherence, and efficacy? Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, right now, I would like to move to our, our next speaker that will address the fourth pillar on cluster detection and response. And our speaker is definitely an expert um, in this area. Um, the, um, Dr. Alexa Oster actually leads CDC's efforts to use molecular uh, and other um, data to detect HIV clusters and outbreaks and respond um, to prevent uh, HIV transmission. Um, and um, Dr. Oster, please go ahead. Hello. In this 10 minute presentation, I'll be talking about the RESPOND pillar, work we broadly describe as cluster detection and response. I'll hit some of the main points and we can get into further detail during the discussion section. I have no conflicts of interest to report. First, a few key points about cluster detection and response. Cluster and outbreak detection allows us to identify when and where HIV is spreading quickly and work to stop that spread. The presence of a cluster or outbreak indicates gaps in our prevention services, which we must address to improve access to services such as ART and PrEP and stop transmission. Cluster and outbreak response uses traditional HIV prevention approaches in a more focused way. It's important to note that the four pillars are not isolated activities, but rather support each other. For example, cluster and outbreak response is a strategy that is critical to guiding other prevention strategies, helping programs identify where these other strategies are most needed. Cluster detection shines a light on populations and networks that aren't being effectively reached by existing prevention activities. Doing so allows cluster response to help programs identify where prevention resources need to be focused. Clusters and outbreaks can be detected in a number of ways. Often, healthcare providers or community members will notice an increase in the number of cases, or a change in the typical demographics of HIV in the area. An outbreak of HIV in Massachusetts was first detected by a provider at a local health center who notified the health department. Partner services can yield important information about transmission clusters as well, although it is limited by the completeness of partner elicitation. The 2015 outbreak in Scott County, Indiana was first detected through partner services as was a recent outbreak among people who inject drugs in Seattle. 
Health departments and CDC can also routinely analyze trends in diagnosis data to systematically identify clusters of increased diagnoses in a geographic area or certain population. This is particularly useful in areas with small populations or low HIV burden and for identifying clusters among people who inject drugs. We refer to clusters identified through this approach as time-space clusters. Recent clusters in West Virginia, Philadelphia, North Carolina, and Northern Kentucky and Ohio were detected through time-space approaches. And a fourth approach, the analysis of molecular data from surveillance, allows us to identify clusters of related infections. CDC and health departments can routinely analyze molecular data to identify clusters of rapid transmission. And molecular analysis can help identify the full scope of an outbreak detected through other approaches. Most data used for cluster detection come from the US National HIV Surveillance System, a robust and comprehensive system for monitoring the burden of HIV. Providers and laboratories report data from clinical encounters to state and local health departments. Data are then submitted to CDC without identifiers. And these data are used at federal, state, and local levels to prevent infections, improve care, and reduce disparities. So once CDC or a health department identifies clusters, what does cluster response entail? Cluster response uses traditional HIV prevention approaches in a more focused way. At a network level, it is important to investigate and intervene. The first step is identifying the entire network to reach people in the network who are outside of the cluster as it was originally detected. This can be done with longstanding public health approaches such as partner services or approaches such as social network strategies. As people are identified as part of the network, it's important to help them access services, including testing, PrEP, syringe services programs, and linkage to HIV care. Response to clusters may also occur at a larger program level. Ultimately, a transmission cluster is evidence that our prevention services have not adequately reached a network. We must use this information to identify and address gaps in programs and services. Now I'd like to spend some time discussing an HIV outbreak among people who inject drugs or PWID in Cabell County, West Virginia, because it offers a tremendous example of the power of cluster response in focusing other interventions. The 82 diagnoses in this outbreak represented a more than 20-fold increase over the prior baseline of two diagnoses per year among PWID in Cabell County. This response was a joint effort of the state and local health departments and CDC, and as the outbreak unfolded, we implemented a wide range of activities in all four EAG pillars. I'll start with respond pillar activities, which included working closely with state and local staff to critically review information about cases and the services available in the area and set goals for the response. Respond pillar activities also included engaging the general public, community organizations, and healthcare providers to raise awareness, provide updates, and discuss opportunities to support their response. This collaboration and coordination allowed us to rapidly implement many prevention and care interventions simultaneously with contributions from many groups. Activities related to the diagnose pillar were a focal point early in the response due to concerns that many cases had not yet been detected. This included expanding the reach of HIV testing events, and the use of rapid HIV testing. The response also included surge capacity for partner services, and over 600 contacts were reached, with numerous small testing events held in jails, community centers, and residential areas as well. The response also included expansion of HIV testing in clinical settings frequented by people who inject drugs, such as substance use disorder treatment facilities and emergency departments. Three pillar activities focused on improving linkage to care, retention in care, and viral suppression. We started with access to care, making sure that case managers were fully engaged and equipped to work with PUID, then progressed to enhance care coordination within a clinic and expanded that to involve health department staff. 
And we also improved linkage to medication-assisted treatment, or MAT, for people with HIV. By December 2019, viral suppression among outbreak cases had increased from 16% to 43%. For the PREVENT pillar, we rapidly expanded access to PrEP and the syringe services program. Knowledge of and access to PrEP were low in Cabell County at the start of the response. Response staff trained more than 100 providers and helped with implementation. Multiple approaches were used to increase enrollment and use of the syringe services program. A newly implemented social network strategy reached nearly 200 people with HIV testing, education, and enrollment in the SSP. And overall, SSP enrollment grew from 366 to 900. Here you see the activities from all four pillars, all of which were critical to this response. But the respond pillar is not only about these large outbreaks. The intensity of our responses can vary along a spectrum. On the one hand, there are a smaller number of very large clusters like the West Virginia one. These are more commonly, though not exclusively, related to injection drug use and more commonly detected through time-space analysis. Responding to these clusters requires surge capacity and often requires major scale-up of services, which can help to advance needed programmatic changes. On the other hand, there are a larger number of smaller clusters. For example, we typically detect approximately 100 molecular and time-space clusters of concern each year. These clusters are commonly related to sexual transmission and more commonly detected through molecular analysis. Responding to these clusters, particularly for moderate and high morbidity jurisdictions, requires building and staffing a routine program to manage multiple clusters that might be occurring at any one time. Responding may require scale up of services and can help to advance needed programmatic changes. And this work also involves fundamental needs, such as infrastructure and capacity for detection, procedures and fiscal mechanisms for response, and communications and policy capacity. We have gained a tremendous amount of experience with cluster response in the past few years. However, we're still refining our answers to a number of scientific and programmatic questions. For example, how do we best identify clusters where potential for impact is greatest? This includes refining methods to account for issues that impact cluster detection, such as late diagnosis and completeness and timeliness of sequence and other surveillance data. Second, once we identify such clusters, how do we maximize impact of cluster response? Which interventions are most important and how do we maximize the use of available resources? Finally, how do we measure and predict impact of cluster response? What are the metrics of success when many changes are structural or strategic? CDC health departments and researchers are working to answer all of these questions. As we work to implement this activity, community engagement is critical to hear priorities and ideas, determine how we can include community partners in response efforts, and identify ways that we can partner to achieve our common goals. This is especially important for working to understand and address potential concerns and maximize the public health benefit of cluster detection and response. I want to close by repeating some of the key points I started with. Cluster and outbreak detection allows us to identify when HIV is spreading quickly. Cluster or outbreak indicates gaps in our prevention services that need to be addressed to improve access to services and stop transmission. And cluster and outbreak response uses standard prevention approaches in a more focused way. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we've had a great introductory session of plenary talks and we'll now move into our abstract presentations. Um, and these are actually uh, all dealing with uh, more of the responses to the fourth pillar. Uh, we'll first hear from uh, Bluma Brenner, who will be talking about evolving trends in Quebec in men having sex with men and new migrants. Um, 
And then the next talk will be Frederico Garcia on HIV trace versus phylogenetic analysis, looking at transmission clusters in Spain. And the third talk will be by Rosanna Scutari from the University of Rome, who will talk about dynamics of HIV-1 transmission clusters in North and Central Italy over the past uh, 2012 to 2019 period. I'd like to thank the organizers for the ability to speak today. I'm going to be talking about HIV sub-epidemics in Quebec and the benefits of treatment as prevention in the uh, averting of new transmissions and changes in the HIV epidemic. And phylogenetics is vital. In 2002, when we initiated the, uh, the genotyping program, it became clear in, to me that it's vital that we use drug resistance testing programs not only to follow drug resistance, but also to follow the dynamics of HIV transmission. And we have 11,000 people who have been genotyped in the program. 8,000 have been new infections diagnosed between 2002 and 2019. And what we do is follow the epidemic in three distinct populations, men who have sex with men, uh, the subtype B epidemic, which is driven by large clusters in which 70% of transmissions cluster and 50% of transmissions are in less large clusters, averaging 20 to 150 individuals sharing the same virus. And if we need epidemic control, we need to avert these large clusters. Among people who injected drugs, uh, there was an epidemic, but epidemic control has been reached by 2012. We still have a subtype B epidemic among patients, but it is not spreading uh, with large level of clustering. And we have the introduction of non-B subtype heterosexual epidemic coming from countries in uh, Francophone countries in Central and West Africa, North Africa, and, uh, and France and largely due to civil war and through migration and globalization. So each epidemic has its own epidemic drivers and phylogenetics become an essential way to follow the epidemic. If we look at the men having sex with men epidemic, we can see a dramatic decline in the epidemic over the last uh, post 2008. This is due to advances in, in, in treatment and also treatment as prevention paradigms. In 2009, uh, the reductions in community viral load with the introduction of single drug therapies with tenofovir, FTC, uh, the introduction of integrase inhibitors and uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis had led to a steady decline in the number of new infections. Unfortunately, it has not led to a reduction in large cluster outbreaks. Heterosexual epidemics are coming into the province and are not, are, are, are limited uh, clustering and haven't crossed over very largely into the population. So we really need to have focus on epidemic control of the men having sex with men of, uh, epidemic. If you look at an HIV tra trace map of all infections between 2002 and 2016 in gray and in 2017 in red, we see that large cluster outbreaks are fueling HIV spread among men having sex with men. These clusters are huge. It is not simply that it is added over a narrow range. These clusters are persistent. Uh, on the blue cluster on the right shows a cluster that existed in Montreal, 44 people got infected and the epidemic came to an end. But it moved and shifted to Quebec City. And in 2017, uh, uh, the, 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 this cluster added 11 new infections. So we have to use uh, trace type of methodologies and all these phylogenetics to follow the growth trajectories and try to break these cycles of large cluster outbreaks. If we look at 49 large cluster outbreaks and we look at them as individual sub-epidemics, each line represents a different epidemic. Heat maps show that 
these large cluster outbreaks are emerging over time. And in the 2014 to 2019 epidemic, we're seeing a shift of several large cluster outbreaks sustaining the HIV epidemic by growing in incredibly high numbers in individual years with anywhere from eight to 20 people added to any given, uh, to different clusters. So if we look at HIV trace and ask what is the fueling factor of these large clusters, what you can see is the age range and a mixing of younger individuals with older individuals. And you see that it's recent stage transmissions that are fueling the HIV epidemic. If you look at sequence-based assays for monitoring the recency of infection, we see that it's recent stage infections that are fueling onward spread of the HIV epidemic. If you look at viral diversity and using 0.44% as a marker of six months or less infection, we see that large cluster outbreaks are being fueled by early stage infections. And uh, later stage small clusters and singleton transmissions with limited size, it's because there are fewer individuals who are early stage infection and late stage transmissions. Uh, if we look at, at, at the, at the uh, violin plot below, we can see that singleton transmissions, introduction of treatment, has in averted new, uh, singleton transmissions, but large transmission cascades of onward transmission among uh, newly infected individuals still continues and needs to be a focus of our treatment as prevention strategies. If we look at the age of individuals in large clusters, we see a dramatic shift towards younger populations. And clearly, we need to refocus uh, our, uh, our campaigns and our public health policies towards individuals who are younger than 30 who are not aware of the dangers of HIV, who have not accessed healthcare, and who are not being treated in early stage infection to avert transmission cascades. If we look at non-B subtypes, we see the slow introduction of non-B subtypes coming from North Africa and, and France. So we have to be able to target our interventions to make sure that we do not have the spread of new non-B subtypes into the province and that we are able to control the epidemic. So we've made tremendous progress in 1990 with 86% of people aware of their status. But of these 86%, uh, the phylogenetics show that half of individuals are late presenters and we're not reaching early stage infections to avert early stage transmission cascades. And we need to tailor our intervention for new arrivals to the province because we have concentrated men having sex with men and these people are vulnerable to infection. And we also need to avert transmissions among younger individuals. Hello, everybody. It is uh, my pleasure to uh, present our data on uh, HIV trace versus the phylogenetic analysis that we have conducted to unravel transmission clusters in, in Spain. So, uh, as you all may know, evaluating transmission chains helps to establish uh, epidemiological measures in order to limit uh, HIV spray spread. And uh, tools that allow real-time evaluation of transmission chains in a simple way and that are accessible to non-highly specialized molecular epidemiologists uh, will certainly help. Uh, HIV-1 trace is a new computational tool to identify molecular transmission clusters in large databases. And, uh, it is based on viral genetic relatedness to a reference sequence in order to construct and visualize the connections among clusters. So in this paper, we aim to identify transmission clusters in CORIS, which is the Spanish cohort of antiretroviral naive adults, by using the HIV-1 trace computational tool. 
And of course we wanted to compare those results with other phylogenetical approaches to really see if this uh, HIV-1 trace tool is really working well or, or not. So uh, for this we use the RD uh, available regions from newly HIV diagnosis in 2018 in Coris. TRACE was used to estimate the transmission clusters in 484 subtype B antiretroviral naive patients. In parallel, we conducted fee analysis by using maximum likelihood method with a bootstrap, bootstrap evaluation using the GTR plus G as nucleotide substitution model. Sequences were phylogenetically analyzed along with all the most similar sequences as identified by a BLAST search and local transmission networks were defined as uh, phylogenetic clusters receiving a uh, bootstrap support value above 70%. Uh, so this is what we found in 484 patients, subtype B patients. Uh, using uh, the HIV-1 trace tool. 130 patients clustered together. We found 54 clusters with a mean cluster size of 2.4, a median cluster size of two individuals, and uh, uh, the range was from two to six individuals with an interquartile range of two to three. This is the spatial representation by the HIV-1 trace datamonkey web server and here you can see the nodes and the node size represents the number of patients included that as we have seen before ranged from two to six patients. Here you can see the biggest nodes which were formed by six patients and here you can see the representation of smaller nodes which are uh, composed or formed by just two patients. We wanted to know how the uh, uh, trace, trace network characteristics were and uh, here we found that uh, most of the patients that clustered together were men and were men that had sex with men. Here you can see the numbers. Uh, the patients were not, uh, 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 there were no differences in um, when we looked at the geographical origin. Here you can see Spanish um, uh, p uh, patients that were from Spain, uh, the number of clusters, and here you can see the patients that were from Spain and that were coming from abroad. And both uh, were uh, higher than those patients that were just coming uh, from abroad. Uh, most of the patients uh, that were clustering lived in the same city or were very very uh, closed uh, uh, with a, a geographical relationship and interestingly when we looked at the patients that were not related uh, by the uh, geographical proximity we found again that uh, uh, the most of these patients were uh, patients that were uh, men that had sex with men and most of the uh, of these patients the majority were living in three big cities in Spain which are Barcelona Madrid and Sevilla and here you can see the interchange between these cities and the uh, uh, relatedness between the patients and of course, we did not only found that these patients were coming from these three big cities, but a small number of patients were coming from other cities and came into these big cities and got infected there. As we said before, we wanted to know how uh, uh, TRACE performed versus phylogenetic analysis. And here you can see what we found. So using phylogenetic analysis, we found more patients that were associated in clusters. 154 patients were clustering together using fee analysis and uh, I, as you remember, 130 
were uh, clustering when we used the trace tool. We also looked at uh, uh, the proportion of patients and that were clustering using trace and phylogenetic analysis. And here you can see that uh, uh, for those patients, those clusters were, that were uh, formed by just two patients, we found more clusters using phylogenetic analysis. And here you can see the results that we found using uh, fee analysis and trace when we compared just the patients that were included in three, uh, three patients per cluster, uh, four patients or five patients. So with this, we would like to conclude that uh, the implementation of uh, HIV-1 trace as a new computational tool is feasible and uh, allows to identify transmission clusters. HIV-1 trace is an easy to use tool allowing the identification of transmission clusters in real time. We believe that this is really important because it uh, allows the use of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, f cluster analysis for labs that are not really skilled in a proper phylogenetic analysis. And this, of course, will help to uh, uh, do more and more studies of clustering and transmission, and of course, to limit HIV spread. Our data revealed that HIV-1 trace identified fewer clusters among the B subtype Spanish patients from 2018 than traditional phylogenetic approaches. Differences were mainly driven by the non-use of a threshold in the patristic di distances when we used phylogenetic analysis. And of course, we feel that more phylogenetic studies are necessary to assess the studies of the uh, new HIV-1 trace tool. So with this, I would like to stop. But before, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, the Italian team uh, that helped us uh, in this study led by Mariela Santoro and uh, Luca Cariotti and of course the uh, uh, Greek team uh, that also helped us and was led by Dimitris Baratskivis and Evangelia Kostakis. So thank you very much and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Good morning everyone. In the recent years, we observe a change of HIV-1 subtype geographic distribution with a constant increase of non-B subtypes, both pure forms and circulated recombinant forms, in regions where subtype B has been prevalent for a long time, such as in Western and Central Europe, including Italy. However, the increasing prevalence of non-B subtypes has been attributed to immigrants and heterosexual transmission. Recently, in Italy, we observe an increase of non-B variants from 16% to 30%. In this study, we evaluate the dynamics and phylogenetic relationship of HIV-1 strains recently circulating in northern and central Italy. For this study, 1770 HIV-1 poll sequences from naive individuals diagnosed in different Italian centers in 2012 to 2019 were included. Of them, 300 were diagnosed in northern Italy and 1470 were diagnosed in central Italy. The phylogenetic tree was built using HIV trace and confirmed by a maximum likelihood approach. Sequences linked with at least one other sequence with a bootstrap higher than or equal to 0.90 and a mean pairwise distance less than or equal to 0.015 were considered genetically linked and classified as either pairs to members or transmissional cluster higher than or equal to three members. Moreover, 
factor associated with transmission of cluster were evaluated by multivariate logistic regression analysis. Looking at the results, in this table we report the main characteristics of population. Most patients are male with a median age of 59 years. 63% of population were infected by HIV-1B subtypes. Regarding risk factors, 44% were MSM and 32% were heterosexual. Compared to Central Italy, HIV-1 diagnosis in Northern Italy presented a lower proportion of MSM, 32% in Northern Italy respect to 48% in Central Italy, and a higher proportion of non-European individual, 29% in Northern Italy respect to 40% in Central Italy and a higher CD4 cell count with a median CD4 cell count in Northern Italy of 364 cell count and 301 in Central Italy and with a lower viral load with a median viral load express has log copy ML of 4.8 in northern Italy and five, five log copy in uh, central Italy. Focusing on the subtypes, HIV-1 non-B subtypes, particularly recombinant form, were more represented in northern than in central Italy. 39% in northern Italy, respect to 36% in central Italy, and in particular 24% of the recombinant form in northern Italy, respect to 17% in central Italy. In detail, the non-B subtypes were more represented by a recombinant form BF02AG and pure form such as A1, C and F1. Focusing on resistance, no difference were found in transmitted drug resistance prevalence between northern and central Italy. In northern, the prevalence were 13.7% respect to 14.1% in Central Italy. Regarding transmissional clusters, we observe 80 pairs and 43 transmissional clusters, corresponding to 15% and 21% of northern and central sequences. Northern transmissional cluster were characterized by a lower prevalence of Italian, 64% respect to 81%, lower prevalence of MSM, 38% respect to 63%, and higher prevalence of non-B subtypes, 55% uh, in Northern Italy respect to 36% in Central Italy. Moreover, sequences from northern and central Italy rarely intermixed. We observed 31 mixed in 9 pairs and 3 transmissional clusters. Two of three mixed transmissional clusters involve HIV-1 non-B subtypes and, and in particular involved recombinant form 02AG and recombinant form 20BG and MSM individuals spending over higher five years. Looking at the distribution of HIV-1 subtype in transmissional cluster and in non-transmissional clusters, transmissional clusters we observe that were more represented by a recombinant form 02AG, recombinant form BF, and uh, pure form such as C form. Moreover, we evaluate the factor associated to transmissional clusters. 
by multivariate logistic regression analysis, infection with HIV-1 non B subtypes, HIV-1 diagnosis in Central Italy, years of diagnosis and homosexual transmission were all factors significantly associated with begin in transmissional clusters. So, in conclusion, overall results highlight the existence of different profiles characterizing new HIV-1 diagnosis and transmission groups in Italy that, in absence of an adequate geographic coverage, will be, will be underestimated. Compared to Central Italy, Northern Italy is characterized by a higher number of HIV-1 non B subtypes and non-European infected individually, actively spreading among transmissional clusters and participating in the epidemiological shift from B subtype to non B subtypes in Italy. Thank you for your attention. That was uh, great. Thank you for all the presenters. And uh, now we have time left for the Q and A's. So please feel free to send your, um, your questions to the chat box. Um, we can go ahead and start with um, some of these questions that we have received. Um, there's one question on the implants and when uh, these will become available uh, for treatment. Maybe Dr. Gulick Tripp can comment. Sure, these are early in development. We have seen data presented at national and international conferences over pilot studies of using implants to deliver antiretrovirals. Uh, there are animal data with compounds that we know well, like tenofovir, um, and we have seen the first human data with an investigational drug called Islatrovir, and that is in development right now. And the initial data showed that an implant with that drug inside, and it's a uh, nucleoside uh, reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, achieved target levels six for six months after putting the implant in. But obviously, we're going to be looking at combinations of drugs uh, rather than single agents. And so we need further data and larger studies. But they are being thought about right now. That was great. Thank you. And, and, and I would echo the same. I think these are mostly at the preclinical stage or very early clinical evaluation. Uh, tomorrow, there will be a talk by Dr. Garcia Lerma looking at uh, macaque models for PrEP development, preclinical assessment and PrEP developments. And now increasingly, the field is moving now into long acting for both prevention and treatment. And then uh, designing these, uh, our group, for example, extremely interested, and in, uh, I know other groups as well, thinking of designing uh, implants from the start for both prevention and for um, for treatment so that uh, we could see the development pathways of both interventions are now overlapping uh, rather than moving in parallel. And then, um, you know, uh, so that would be a better and more cost-effective way of thinking of these uh, products for both applications from the start. Um, I mean, um, Trip mentioned a very good point, which is if you're gonna start thinking of these, designing them for both applications for treatment, we know we will need two drugs. And therefore we might be start thinking, designing uh, implants for, uh, for PrEP, for prevention, that will likely include also two, two drugs, but maybe different release profiles and that sort of thing. But very, very exciting times for, um, uh, for, for, for this, um, for these product developments. So there, there's a question by Bill Switzer, and he's asking, is there a needle disposal challenge for long-acting implants? I don't know if Dimitri wants to try to take that or any of our speakers. This is Dimitri. I mean, I can start, I think. I, um, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Excellent. Great. So. Um, 
I think that potentially for uh, for long acting injectables, that you know, a, a part of the plan has to be appropriate uh, needle disposal strategies. It also, I think, depends on uh, venue. Uh, for the use of the long acting injectables, um, rather if they're done at home versus in a uh, in a clinical environment. I think ultimately, um, if there is a home based strategy for injectable long acting uh, use of either uh, for treatment or prevention, that uh, that uh, again this this is an operational challenge that is necessary uh, to address in in the planning um, for uh, for that intervention. So there could be. Uh, it just needs to be a part of the actual uh, planning going forward, as opposed to a, a, a afterthought of uh, of initiating um, <clears throat> home long acting uh, uh, pre exposure prophylaxis or treatment. I think ultimately there are models uh, uh, both for um, other drugs, hormones, et cetera, that people are able to do home injection. And again, um, as part of the implementation uh, plan of this technology, uh, such a strategy needs to be such a consideration needs to be a part of of the operationalization of the strategy. Uh, I might just add that the first long-acting injectable that we're likely to see is cabotegravir, the integrase inhibitor with rilpivirine injectable, the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. All the studies with these for treatment and the studies for PrEP with uh, cabotegravir alone involved administration in a healthcare setting because they're a gluteal administration and it's difficult to self-administer a gluteal administration. So at least initially, I think these will be done in healthcare settings, although as Dimitri mentioned, um, it would be more convenient for people if there was home-based injections as well. Right. So uh, Bill Switzer also has some questions for the uh, cluster analysis presenters. Um, so the question has to do with the HIV trace tool, and he's asking about what is the genetic distance threshold used by that, uh, that tool, and did you try different bootstrap cutoffs for the comparison? Uh, for my studies, uh, I use less than 1.5%, which is the same that we use for maximum likelihood trees. And we did not see, uh, and we have relatively strict criteria to call clusters, and we did not see a significant difference in cluster calls with trace versus our maximum likelihood methods. Uh, apart from, a, let's say we have a cluster of 150 people, only two people didn't cluster with trace that clustered with maximum likelihood. Great. In, yeah, my, okay. in my work, I use a bootstrap higher than or equal to 0 0.90, and uh, I compare with other cutoff, and uh, I don't see uh, differences. Yes, we, we didn't uh, look at different cutoffs with the uh, uh, trace tool uh, to see uh, which could be the differences in the number of clusters we didn't uh, find with uh, trace and we did find with the uh, uh, fee analysis. Okay, we, um, we have another related question. This is more on uh, what's your opinion regarding labs migrating away from Sanger sequencing towards NGS for HIV cluster analysis? and drug resistance detection, mutation resistance detection. Happy to, to take the first stab at that one. I can say that in the United States, we're already seeing that migration occur. Uh, a lot of the large commercial labs are shifting from Sanger to next generation sequencing. There are efficiencies, both in terms of time and cost that are uh, encouraging them to do so. Uh, for the perspectives of cluster analysis and drug resistance analysis, fortunately, we're able to use a consensus sequence in the same way as we use a Sanger sequence. So that transition um, is not looking to be very difficult for us as we continue to monitor national data um, for drug resistance and cluster analysis. Yeah, at least uh, uh, here in Spain, uh, uh, it's almost 50-50. Uh, uh, there's a, a, 
Spain is a small country. We have a lot of labs doing uh, uh, sequencing. Uh, uh, people are not very happy with NGS because it's a uh, it's more uh, it's more labor intensive than doing uh, Sanger sequencing, uh, uh, but but uh, nevertheless, I should say it's fifty percent doing NDS and fifty percent keeping on Sanger sequencing. And of course, uh, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Roster on that you can uh, very very easily use a consensus sequence obtained from NDS to do your cluster analysis. Uh, uh, do, uh, uh, with fee or or even with a with a trace tool. Okay. Thank you. And um, we have a question for uh, Dr. Deskalakis, um, which um, which is about what would it take or what needs to be done to determine if the two one one on demand. Truvada prep could be extended to other risky groups than MSM. So that's a very uh, super complex question, and one of the areas that I highlighted that we needed to sort of have a deeper consideration. I, I'll actually edit that question um, and just say that um, really uh, work focusing on intermittent strategies for uh, groups other than MSM are important to evaluate and to explore. So I think that again, the two one one strategy, though off guidelines at this point. Um, has provided um, some flexibility for some MSM. And I think that um, that emphasizing in research agendas uh, the need for uh, for less frequent dosing in other populations, including transgender men and women, um, as well as cis women, is really critical. Again, it may not be uh, tenofovir and tricitabine 211 um, that is the correct uh, sort of strategy, um, given that there are some biological issues potentially, especially in, in individuals who have uh, other than anal sex. I, I do think that uh, really work focusing on both preclinical pre and clinical to identify uh, really a minimal package um, that, um, that provides prevention and potentially also addresses some of the uh, barriers and stigma uh, associated with daily prep is critical in other populations. So in, in really in effect, the answer is uh, a research agenda has to actually include um, the idea of uh, intermittent uh, strategies or less than daily strategies for other populations in a very uh, 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 purposeful way rather than as a uh, as an uh, as an uh, a side thought. Yeah, and then and we would add to there's already preclinical data from um, uh, regimens including integrase inhibitors like um, Gemvoya or 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 Bictarvi that uh, animal data, macaque data show that they are very effective at a single dose around the exposure pre prep or, or, or post. That's work from CDC as well as from uh, Gilead in the case of the big tarvi. So the, 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 the field is evolving to identifying uh, even simple, more simple uh, regimens for on-demand oral uh, prep that goes maybe limited to a single or two, two doses around the exposure. I see Phyllis, have you screening more questions here? Um, maybe I could ask a question. I'd like to ask a question of, of Jeff Johnson about a, a couple of questions about diagnostics. Um, so I've been sort of amazed at watching the diagnostic uh, approvals for SARS-CoV-2 and, and wonder how we can actually get to EUA approval for self self-testing for COVID-2 and we still don't have that for, for HIV. And it seems like a, a real need if we want to uh, get to the end of the epidemic. And then maybe uh, after you answer that, you could also talk a little bit about HIV-2 diagnostics in the US. Sure, thanks for the question. Yes, you actually raise a topic that has caused <clears throat> quite a bit of discussion amongst uh, those of us in the um, diagnostics community and recognizing that um, an expansion in the capability of self-testing is probably a necessary step to be able to reach the uh, testing goals that, um, that we would hope to achieve with the diagnosed pillar. Um, there are a few issues. Um, as you know, the COVID tests are under emergency use authorization and those can only be done under you know, very limited uh, testing restrictions. That and um, compounding that, uh, so the application 
one would have to adopt the notion that the ongoing uh, epidemic or pandemic of HIV is at an emergency state, and then you know there would have to be no federal um, language around that. But compounding that issue, as I raised before, is that HIV is uh, considered a high-risk testing device, uh, so it's classified under FDA Class Three, and the requirement for getting approvals of these high-risk devices are quite uh, intensive as far as the data that are needed to provide um, in order to ensure uh, that the tests are performing uh, as, as hoped. So slightly, I mean, it's a little bit of apples and oranges, but understanding that um, HIV, as I pointed out in one of my slides, self-testing is an area that I think does need uh, considerable refocus. Uh, some of us at, at CDC and also in discussions with FDA have voiced our opinions on this. And we're hoping that um, we can come to a, a path forward that'll allow us to uh, provide data uh, in conjunction uh, with studies and manufacturers that would hopefully appease the need to allow a uh, more rapid pipeline for uh, self-testing uh, in, in the US. As far as HIV-2, um, <clears throat> there is still, uh, while its uh, prevalence in the US is very, very uh, small compared to HIV-1, there are cases, particularly uh, amongst individuals who immigrate from countries uh, where HIV-2 is endemic, um, that will complicate uh, HIV diagnostics. And, um, and so often, you know, in our reference lab, we might get uh, requests from uh, care providers that will uh, allow us to better distinguish between the infections because sometimes there can be cross reactivities and issues amongst that. However, uh, HIV-2 need, uh, the need for HIV-2 diagnostics, uh, since treatment for both of those HIV types is uh, somewhat different, um, there is a need to better diagnose or distinguish between those two types. But the burden of HIV-2 is such that um, you know, maybe not a lot of manufacturers might see a, uh, a marketplace for them. But we are continuing to uh, develop those uh, diagnostics um, in partnership with uh, some uh, reference labs who might see uh, more prevalence of HIV-2 in their communities. So there is a, while not a huge burden, there is still a current interest in maintaining HIV-2 um, differentiation assays. John, John Brooks, you made a comment you wanna, regarding EHE and testing? No? Okay. Because like, hopefully the EHE initiative would push through expansion of testing approval. As, uh, since testing is a critical component of EHE. But how, how, does, how does the FDA regulate uh, hepatitis C testing or STI testing? Are they all the same class, class three, or some of them are two? And, and when do we expect to hear from the current update on the reclassification from FDA? Any update on that? I haven't heard anything. I don't know, Jeff, you, on the reclassification so activity? Um, so some tests, uh, for instance, viral load, may be soon reclassified, um, such, such as uh, the burden for approval of, of tests such as HIV viral load may be less. However, um, when it comes to home testing, there is no evidence at all that uh, the requirements for approval for home-based testing are going to be relaxed anytime in the near future. So it will be, um, it will be an ongoing discussion with with uh, us and regulatory agencies and um, community input is gonna be very important to that um, so that we all can have kind of a unified voice saying that this really is uh, a way that we need to be moving forward to achieve our, our testing and our status knowledge goals. I just wanna add that, um, you know, the way we're looking at this is if we want to have ending the HIV epidemic really be the national priority that it should be then we need to prioritize it the same way that we're prioritizing ending COVID now. 
And I'm hoping that as uh, the new administration comes in, you know, we have the opportunity to refresh the discussion that this will be an opportunity to also move this forward. Yeah, definitely. What's the cost differential between uh, approving a class three versus a class two, John or, or, or Jeff or are we talking? Do you, do you know, Jeff? I don't know offhand. I just know it's an order of magnitude greater. <laughs> yes, it's yes, it's in the hundreds of thousands for class two versus millions of dollars for a class three. So again, you know, as I mentioned, cost is a huge uh, kind of consideration in bringing a test to market, and approval processes for those tests are definitely weighing in in that. Um, so. Again, you know, if we can find a way forward that will alleviate at least some of that while allowing us to show um, <clears throat> the, the target product profiles for sensitivity and specificity, um, maybe that'll allow us to obtain a wider options for HIV testing, again, in support of the VHE, which, you know, we're all in, obviously, here at CDC, as well as, well as our partner agencies. So we're trying to find a way forward with this. Great. I think we've had a wonderful session and I'd, I'd really like to thank all the presenters for um, dealing with the technology and keeping to time and, and giving us some great insights. Um, I think the session really tried to use the U.S. example of ending the HIV epidemic and we had some great presentations um, from some of the leaders in this field. Uh, we heard about the diagnosis, uh, the first pillar which relies on um, early diagnosis, which will be key, uh, has to deal with, uh, I think, a, a, an important phrase that was given called the going from the lab to the living room and uh, hoping that we'll get to some new technologies as well as approvals for self-testing. Um, treatment, we have effective treatments uh, and we have more that are coming down the pike, uh, but we, do recognize that there's still some disparities in who, who, who is accessing uh, treatment and also who's achieving viral suppression. Uh, and we know that it's important that if you're undetectable that you're less likely to transmit. So it's a key part of the, the treatment pillar. Uh, the third pillar is prevention and really dealing with some very efficacious prevention interventions that we have, both uh, many different types of PrEP and new ones on the way, as well as uh, syringe service uh, programs. And uh, we heard a lot about the um, issues of how we need to, to try to simplify PrEP and deal with communities so that we can uh, get better acceptability uh, and focus on implementation science so that we can improve the rollout of these uh, effective programs. And then finally, um, responding to outbreaks. And we had um, not only a great uh, presentation from Alexa at CDC, but also from our presenters in, in, in Canada, uh, Spain, uh, Italy, um, and, and really, better understand some of the tools that are out there to early detect these outbreaks, uh, what we, we can learn about the epidemiology of these outbreaks uh, from these tools, uh, and then focus our, our various uh, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention pillars uh, to address the outbreaks to uh, get a more effective elimination. So uh, I'll end there and just say uh, thank you again to all our speakers and um, we'll see you at the next session.